So in this video, we'll be working through some more limit definitions of the derivative. So I have one more video, which is very popular, starting with really the very basics of these. This video is with a little bit harder problems. So if you feel like you've got the basics, but you're having a hard time once the problems get trickier, this is definitely the video for you. Um, here's the four problems I'll be doing. You can also jump directly to the problem you want by clicking the links in the comments below. All right, with that, let's get started. All right, so as a reminder, the limit definition of the derivative is that the f prime of x is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So for this first one especially, let's work carefully here through what's going on. So what we see is first we have f of x plus h. So what that means is in your equation, everywhere you see an x, you need to replace it with an x plus h. So here I replace that x on the inside with an x plus h, and then this other x also gets replaced with an x plus h. Um, I highly recommend you use parentheses. It tends to just make things easier to work with. So with that, we can go ahead and fill in the first part here. This is x plus h cubed. Now for the next part, f of x, we can see is just written right there, right? f of x equals x cubed. So I can just plug that part in. Next, on the bottom, we just have h. So at this point, it can be a little tricky because it's not clear what to do next. But generally, a good strategy is if you see something that you can square out or cube it or whatever it might be, it's probably a good idea to do that. So this x plus h cubed, we can probably expand that. So let's keep doing our work over here. Remember, that means x plus h multiplied by itself three times. So if you take, for example, the first two and you foil them out, you get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then we've still got one more, x plus h hanging out at the end there. Okay, so if we fold that out and we take and multiply it through, we get x cubed plus x squared h plus 2x squared h plus 2xh squared plus h squared x plus h cubed. And we can see that there's a few like terms here. The x cubed is on its own, but for the x squared h's, we've got three of them. And same thing for the x h squareds, we've got three of them. And then we've got this one x cubed on its own. So now with that, we can go ahead and plug that back into what we had before. So that's x cubed plus three x squared h plus three x h squared plus h cubed minus the x cubed that was already there all of that over h. So the reason we wanted to do all this is now we see what happens is on the top, some things can cancel. So this x cubed and the negative x cubed can cancel. So that leaves us with three x squared h plus three x h squared plus h cubed all over h. And the strategy at this point and the strategy at this point now is to factor an h out of the top. And the reason we want to do that is so that we can cancel it in the next step. So you can see that there's an h in all of these terms. So I can cancel, excuse me, I can factor it out. And once I do that, I've now got this h on top and bottom that can cancel each other out. So at that point, I go ahead and do that. And I end up with just nothing on the denominator anymore because it canceled. And I've got 3xh plus h squared. And now I can just plug in h equals 0. And you can see the only term that's left is 3x squared. So at the end, our final answer is f prime of x equals 3x squared. Okay, let's go ahead and jump on to the next problem. Okay, so just like last time, we're going to start this by taking f of x and figuring out this f of x plus h, which again just means taking any x's you see and replacing them with an x plus h. I feel like you generally do better if you use parentheses. It helps you not make mistakes with signs and all that. And let's just do a little bit of cleanup before we go further. We could distribute that negative sign and we end up with that. And on the bottom, uh, we just have what we had before. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and plug that into the first one there. So if we do that, we get two minus x minus h over one plus x plus h. Remember, f of x is just what we started with in the first place, nothing special there. And then all this still has the h on the bottom. So 
let's go ahead and go forward again. Um, what's happening is really similar to the last problem where we've got on top these two fractions that we're subtracting and we just, and we just wanna be able to actually subtract them. So the way to do that is to get a common denominator. So we're gonna multiply each of them by what they're missing. So again, on the left, that's just the one plus x that was on the bottom of the other. And on this one, it's the one plus x plus h. Now this is a little annoying just because it's so ugly, but it's one of those things that once you do it, if you just trust the process, all the algebra works out well at the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and start doing that algebra out. So on top, uh, we've got one plus x times two minus x minus h over one plus x times one plus x plus h. And we can see we've already got the common denominator. So let's go ahead and just stick this into one fraction right away, just to save ourselves a little bit of writing here. And of course, we're still dividing by h on the bottom. Let's just go ahead and put that on the bottom with the other terms there. So again, just like the last problem, uh, the bottom, we're gonna leave it alone because our goal actually is for that H on the bottom to be canceled later. So we don't wanna do more work than we need to. And what you see if you do that is the only things that are left on the top is negative three H. We have a negative H here and another negative two H over there and every other term canceled out. Um, and that's just from going through and doing the algebra. So again, at this point, remember the goal is always to plug in h equals zero, but the problem is we've got that h on the bottom, which would make us divide by zero. But now we can see we can cancel out those h's. So if we do that, we're just left with a negative three on the top and this one plus x times one plus x plus h on the bottom there. And now we can just plug in zero and everything is just fine and we get one plus x times one plus x. Or in other words, we could finish this out by saying the derivative of x is equal to negative three over one plus x squared. And there we go, there is our derivative. So this problem was really more about just getting common denominators and then just working through the steps. So with that, let's go ahead and jump on to the next one. Okay, so let's jump into this. So what we'll do is we'll start by taking and figuring out what f of x plus h is. Remember all that means, is just taking your equation anywhere you see an x, replacing it with x plus h. And I think it's good to use parentheses just to not make mistakes with your signs. And while we've got it over here in our scratch work, I'll go ahead and distribute that negative two through to both of them. So if we do that, now we can come in and plug that in and we've got square root of one minus two x minus two h. And what is f of x? That's just in the top left there. So that's just the original one that we started with. Okay, so now on the bottom, nothing has changed. We've just got h. So this is where it can seem a little tricky because it's not clear what you should be doing at this point, right? How do you go any further? And there's just a trick to it, which is multiplying by the conjugate. So what the conjugate means is the exactly what's on the top there, in this case where we're taking those square roots and subtracting them but instead of subtracting them, you add them. So what that means is we'll be multiplying by the same term as what we currently have on the top, but I'll be changing this to a plus in the middle there. And this seems strange and it's not at all clear why that's gonna help, but it's one of these tricks that once you learn it, you realize what it does is it just makes the algebra be nicer. That's really it, there's no magic. It just makes the algebra be nicer so that you can cancel things out that you need to cancel out. So with that, let's go ahead and just start with the algebra. So the trick is that the top is the difference of squares. And if you remember what difference of squares is, is when you're multiplying two things and they're exactly the same, but the difference is on one of them is a plus and one of them is a minus, and it doesn't matter which is which. And if you just FOIL this out, you get x squared minus xy plus xy minus y squared. And the point is those terms in the middle cancel each other out and you're just left with x squared minus y squared. In other words, you're just left with the first one squared minus the second one squared. So notice that's what we've got up top. The things that we're multiplying are identical across both of them. It's just one's a plus and one's a minus. So for example, on a test, if you're trying to save yourself time, you could remember this and do it this way rather than doing all that big multiplying. So if we do that, what we see is we would end up getting on the top this first term would be squared minus the second term would also be squared. 
and our bottom is going to stay exactly the same. We're going to go ahead and just leave it as it is. So a good suggestion is don't multiply it out until you know you really need to. Because what can happen is you end up doing more, more multiplying than you need to. On the bottom, we don't need to right now. So now on the top, if we just go ahead and let the square and the square root cancel each other out, we end up with 1 minus 2x minus 2h, and we'll distribute this minus sign, minus 1 plus 2x, and again, the bottom's going to stay exactly what it was before. So what you want to be looking at at the top now is, hey, we can do some canceling here, right? There's some terms that are identical. So the negative 2x, the positive 2x, and the 1 and the negative 1. So on the top, we're just left with negative 2h. And maybe now you're seeing that, hey, this is great because those h's are going to be able to cancel each other out. So once we do that, we can let the h on the top and the bottom cancel each other out. And we're just left with negative 2 on the top. And on the bottom, we've got 1 minus 2x minus 2h along with the other square root. And again, the point is now we can go ahead and plug in h equals 0 because we're not dividing by 0 anymore. So we're left with negative 2. On the bottom is root 1 minus 2x because that uh, plugging in h equals 0 makes that go away, plus another of the exact same thing. Or if you want to clean that up a little bit, you're left with negative 2 over 2 times the square root of 1 minus 2x and cancel out the 2's and you're left with negative 1 over square root of 1 minus 2x. So at that point, we have now finished our problem. We got f prime of x is negative 1 over root 1 minus 2x. Okay, so let's get on to this problem. So this one can seem pretty difficult just because there's both the fraction and the square root and there is a little more stuff to it, but it's very doable. So let's go ahead and start out as usual with just the limit definition of the derivative. So just like last time, our very first step is going to be dealing with this f of x plus h. So remember all that means is taking any x's you see and replacing them with an x plus h. So we can now go ahead and plug that in. So we take the x's, replace it with the x plus h, which gives us this term. Uh, what is f of x? That's just in the top left corner. That's what we started with, the original problem, and still over the h. So here's where it can get a little tricky because you think, like, how do I go forward with this, right? What happens next? Well, the thing you can do a lot of times is if you have fractions, go ahead and add or, in this case, subtract those fractions. And the way to do that is for us to first get common denominators. So what we can do on the top is we can give each fraction what it's missing. So in this case, that would mean the one on left gets a square root of x on the top and bottom, and the one on the right gets an x plus h on the top and on the bottom. So if we go ahead and start doing this work now, we can go ahead and get square root x minus square root x plus h over what's our new denominator. All of this over our original h. So this is kind of tricky to see here just because there's so much stuff, right? There's this fraction inside the fraction, there's square roots. A good trick you can do sometimes though is just make things look nicer. Uh, rather than having the h on the bottom, that's the same thing as saying the square root x minus square root x plus h, and then the h just down here on the bottom with the other terms. So that makes things a little easier so you don't have quite as many fractions within fractions. Okay, so what do we do next at this point? So what happens now is on the top when you're subtracting two square roots, the trick you want to use is multiplying by the conjugate. And I go through this trick in my other video. A link is up in the top below. I um, mean, so you can multiply by the conjugate and then that cancels out the terms. So let's go ahead and do that. So first off, let's write out what would the conjugate be. So remember the conjugate is where you take the thing that's giving you trouble, in this case, it's the numerator there. And you multiply by exactly the same thing, but you switch the signs. So in this case, that would be square root of x plus square root of x plus h. That's what we mean by switching the sign, that sign in the middle there. And that may seem like a very strange trick, but the point is, it's one of these things where when you do it, it just makes the algebra work out better. Um, so that's really the best way to think about it is when you have these weird ones where you've got two square roots and you're either adding or subtracting them, if you multiply by the conjugate, the algebra just works out nicer. 
So you can go ahead and do all the multiplying on the top. I'll save you lots of the multiplying on the top. But what you would get is x minus x plus h on the top. The bottom, you really don't want to multiply it out if you don't have to yet. So you want to save yourself work, especially, for example, if you're working on a test and you're limited on time. You don't want to end up doing more work than you need to. So now let's go ahead and look at the top. Obviously, we've got a little bit of algebra we can do up there, some simplifying, and that we've got the x minus x. So if you distribute that negative sign on top, you're just left with negative h. And let's go ahead and write out again what's on the bottom, so nothing here is changing at all. And remember I said that we didn't necessarily want to multiply the bottom out if we don't need to. And here, in fact, we're going to see we really don't need to do it. And the reason is we've got this h on top, and we've got this h sitting out on bottom that can cancel each other out. So if I let those cancel each other out, what I'm left with is exactly what I had on the bottom, except that h is now gone. Now, it may not really seem like it, but we're actually basically done at this point. The reason I say we're done is, remember for the limit definition of the derivative, your goal is always to just plug in h equals zero. But you can't do that at the start because you're dividing by h, which means you're dividing by zero. But remember that h that was on the bottom, we just canceled it out. So it's gone. So we're not dividing by it anymore. So at this point, let's just try. What happens if we plug in h equals zero? Well, there's no h's on the top. On the bottom, x plus zero is x. We've got another x. Again, we've got another x plus zero, which is another x. So at that point, as you can see, we've basically finished the problem here. Square root x times square root x is x plus 2x. Uh, so we got 1 over x times 2 square root x. Or in other words, we've got 1 over 2x root x. And you can write that a little differently with some different algebra if you like. But at that point, we are now done with our problem. And we can say that the derivative is 1 over 2 x square root x. And there we go. So that was one that had a lot of algebra to it. But really, the main trick to it was two steps. One, getting the common denominators early on so that we could actually subtract those two fractions. And then two, multiplying by the conjugate, which let us get rid of those square roots on top there. OK, let's go ahead and go on to the next problem. All right, so that's working through the much more complicated examples of the limit definition of the derivative. If that was helpful or if there's more problems you'd like me to look at, please leave a comment below, leave a like, and I'll be sure to follow with more, more videos. All right, everyone. Thanks and have a good one.